glory. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. All right, I already got it turned on, Brother Blake. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn, if you would, to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. <clears throat> We're going to read just one verse here, and then... And then I'm going to uh, introduce the message and tell you why I sang that song a while ago. Psalm chapter 73 and verse 1. Psalm 73 verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean Heart. Let me read that again. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. God cannot be good unless He is good. And God is very, very good. When God created the earth, and he, after the six days were over, He looked at everything He had made, and it was very good. So, the first point of my message, which I haven't given the title to yet, but the first point of my message is that God is good. God is good. He is extremely good. He is good to perfection. He's a good, good God. Now turn to Psalm uh, 14. Psalm chapter 14. Psalm chapter 14. And verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of man to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And that's written by David. Now turn to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. It's amazing how God can make something so good and it goes so bad. So does that mean God's not good? No. It, the problem is, He is love. The Bible says that God is love. 1 John uh, 4, 8. God is love. Love means to choose. You have to have a choice before you can love anything. I really doubt that cows love grass. I think they just eat it by instinct. They're wired to eat grass. Just like pigs are wired to wallow in the mud. I don't want to go wallow in the mud. Most dogs don't want to wallow in the mud. Uh, most cats don't want to wallow in the mud. But pigs were made to wallow in the mud. Well, man's not made to sin, but God gave us free will. And he gave us all kinds of blessings. He gave us the, the ability to desire something, to want something, to be able to discern between something that tastes good, something that doesn't taste good, something that's sweet or sour or bitter, 
Uh, he gives us these abilities to see things with our eyes and not just things, see things like a robot sees them, but to make judgments of what we see. Oh, that is beautiful. Or, oh, that is horrible. Oh, that's scary. You know, he gives us abilities and degrees to, to enjoy things or to fear things or to be careful of things and to make decisions and to choose. And God, therefore, also created evil. Because he is good, and he wants us to love him, because he is love, so he wants that love reciprocated, but to do so, to enjoy love, he had to give us an alternative. He had to give us a choice, and he had to, 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 even, to even begin to consider being loved, he had to create something that could choose whether to love him or not, whether to choose him over something else. And so God made man... Subject to vanity, the Bible says in Romans 8.20. Not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. God gave us free will, hoping we'd use it right. And uh, so, my message today, because I've shown you briefly the difference between a, a good God and man. Man, with that freedom to choose chose so poorly that pretty soon they took pleasure in wickedness to where the whole world got so bad God was sorry that he felt bad that he even made man. It was causing him so much grief and he decided to just destroy man from off the face of the earth. And every creeping thing, I mean probably is so bad that, that, that Men were, were committing bestiality and, and who knows how, what kind of wickedness was going on. But God was fed up with it and he destroyed the earth except for one man, Noah, found grace in the sight of the Lord. And he had three sons and he had a wife and his three sons had wives. There's the goodness of God right there. He didn't just kill all of them except for Noah. He could have taken a rib from Noah and made another man. You know, ribs will regenerate, they say. <laughs> So he could generate or create a woman out of, out, of, out of Adam, and he did. He could have done that with Noah, but God is a gracious God, and he's loving, and he's merciful. But he can get fed up to, to a limit where he says, that's it. There's a line that man can cross, and that's just an example of how wicked we can become. So let me give you a couple other scriptures, but, um, and then I'll give you the, 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 the title of the message and the, the whole point. Of this message, turn to, turn if you would to Psalm uh, eighty-four, eleven. Psalm eighty-four, eleven. I'm going to preach on one of the most amazing, to me, the most amazing subject. It's just amazing. Psalm eighty-four, verse eleven. The Bible says, "For the Lord God is a sun and shield." The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Why is it that there's no good thing that he'll withhold? Because he's a good God. Just another verse to prove that God is good. And there's no good thing that he'll withhold from those that walk uprightly. All right. Now turn to Psalm 143. Psalm 143. Psalm 143 and verse 10. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of our brightness. In John 4, 24, Jesus tells the woman at the well that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. So God is the spirit, and here... Psalmist David says, thy spirit is good. You know why? Because God is good. God is good. His spirit is good. Now turn to uh, Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19. And verse 17. Matthew 19, 17. And he said unto, oh, let's start verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? 
There's a lot of people wondering what they can do to get to heaven. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So, and I'm not going to why Jesus said that. There's a reason he said that. But you don't get to heaven by keeping the commandments. Because no, number one, no one can. Um, and number two, uh, <laughs> it's obviously the only way we get to heaven is through faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. So, but he says... He says this man who, who addressed him as good master, knowing that this man that came and called him good master is not saved, doesn't know the, the gospel, doesn't know the truth of the gospel, and he doesn't know who Jesus is. So he didn't, he didn't come to Jesus because he knows who Jesus is, that he's, that he's God manifest in the flesh. He came to Jesus because Jesus is famous for doing good works. And so he says, good master. And Jesus catches him on that and said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So it happens that Jesus is God. So the man was right, but he doesn't know why he's right. So he's wrong in his thinking for addressing Jesus as good master. It's like we shouldn't say, hey, good sir, good man. Just address people plainly. Don't flatter them. Don't, don't give things that they don't deserve. Uh, man is not good by nature. We're not. And so I'm, I'm making a contrast. I'm trying to make a contrast and show you how that God only is good. There's none good. Jesus said there's none good but one. That is God. So uh, now let's look at the, con the, 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 the contrast there. T turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Just get some uh, more verses in your arsenal to use if you need to. Romans chapter 4. Uh, is that right? Oh, I'm sorry. Revelation chapter 4. Uh, my eyes aren't seeing too good over here. Oh, that's what we're missing. Uh, Caleb, can you uh, pull that lamp over here and turn it on? That'll shed light over here. Then I can, then I can see what I'm trying to read. <laughs> All right. Not too far, but yeah, that's fine. Hope it's not in anybody's eyes. Yeah, make that bottom one come on. Yeah, there we go. Um, all right. Revelation chapter 4. Yeah. Revelation chapter 4. Thank you. Revelation chapter 4 and verse... Uh, uh, if I can read that. Yeah, verse 8. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. The Bible says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So John is allowed to see into heaven, and, and he's transported actually there, and he's in heaven, and he sees these four beasts, and all they do is they rest not day and night, because all the time they're saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. See, folks, our God is holy. He is so holy. We cannot comprehend how holy he is. And by contrast, man is such a sinner. Um, all right, turn to John chapter... Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, that's not a right reference. Um, so let's go to 1 Samuel. Oh, I know, it's Joshua. My H doesn't have much of a hump, and I thought it was... Or, or, or the, um, yeah, that is an H. I just squeezed the O and the S so close together I couldn't tell the difference. Look like one letter. All right, Joshua 24. That makes sense. All right, because I know I was in Joshua earlier today, so that must be it. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 19. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. Now, he's talking about the fact the Lord drave, drave out the wicked people before them. 
the Amorites, for example. And, uh, and, and therefore, he says in the previous verse, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And that's what the people are saying to him. But the people have kind of backslidden a little bit. And Joshua knows that. And he says, ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. See? So man is not holy. God is. And we cannot serve God because we're not a holy people. He's a holy God. Now, we can try to serve God, but we don't serve him very well because of the contrast. We're, we're so ungodly. We're not like him. Now, God has made a way where we become godly, but only by a new creation when something new gets born in us. But let me tell you something. The older I get, the more cognizant and aware and strongly, you know, without a doubt, I know, I can say like the Apostle Paul, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The, more, the closer I get to God, the closer I walk with God, the more vile I see myself, my flesh, my old nature. It's like, I don't, want, I don't understand how God puts up with me. And I realize, what a great gap there is. No wonder God said, my ways are higher than your ways, as the, the, the heavens are higher than the earth. Or, so are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I know I butchered that, that verse but, in Isaiah. But, but God is so much holier than we are, so much better than we are. So the question comes, <coughs> the question comes, how... Can we serve him? How can we have relationship with him? Um, I mean, it's, it's like, how can we, how, what can bridge the gap between us and God? That's why I sang that song. And uh, that, that song we sang a while ago, At Calvary. Um, I love that third verse. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the, and this is, what I, this is what I'm focused on. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. See, Jesus hung on a cross to picture that God is trying to make a way where we can cross from sinful man. We can pass from death into life. We can cross from sinful man to holy men and, and people of God. We can become a holy people, peculiar, uh, but only through the new birth. The only thing that could span the gap between God, a holy God, and an unholy man, and, and sinful man, is the grace of God. That's the only thing that can span such a gap. The grace of God. So the title of the message is, The Bridge of Grace. Or the span of grace, whatever you want. The Bridge of Grace. Something had to go. If God made us to have fellowship with us, but he made us a free will and we've sinned, there's a gap between us. Jeremiah said, your sins have separated between you and your God. <coughs> Our sins will se separate us from God. God can't walk, is not walk, can't walk with sinful man. Now, he can walk amongst us, but he can't walk with us much because we're so sinful. The only way is if we can get his grace in our life where we get his forgiveness. And when a new creature gets created that he can walk with. See, I can walk with God not because of my flesh. That's what separates me from God. But I can walk with God because I've been born again. I have a spirit that never sins. I have a spirit that is holy. It was born of God, has his attributes and if you've been born again, you can walk with God, but you still have free will. You can also choose to walk in the flesh if you want to. So, what's the bridge? The bridge is grace, the grace of God. Uh, let me tell you the story behind that song that we sang, the, the tune. I mean, the song people know, you know, a lot of folks that go to church, they know it starts off, years I spent in vanity and pride, right? That's the familiar tune. But let me just tell you the story of why I wrote this new tune. When my mom was still living, I used to go every Sunday night after church, pretty much every Sunday night, rarely missed, and I'd go and f visit with mom and dad. And, uh, and so usually my mom was sitting in her favorite chair. It's like you've got a favorite chair and you've got a favorite chair. Mom was sitting in her favorite chair, and it was by the piano and uh, kind of facing the piano, and she'd sit there and do her needlework or 
knitting, crocheting, or doing a crossword puzzle. Um, and so she could do that and talk. So she'd keep her hands busy. She was always a busy, hard-working woman. And uh, she kept her hands busy, but she'd talk, and she'd think a lot. And I'd come in there, and I knew they, we grew up with piano all the time, playing gospel songs and classical music. And so I was, uh, I'd go and sit down, and I'd just start playing. I was playing some gospel songs and, and maybe some classical. I don't remember that, that detail, but I believe I was playing some gospel songs at the time. And all of a sudden, she interrupted me, or maybe in between songs, she said, she said, Tim, and I said, what? said, you know, uh, the song at Calvary? I said, yes. She said, those words are so good. They deserve a better tune. We sing years I spent in vanity and pride, care. It's almost like a March song, you know. And, uh, and she says, those words are just so... Uh, magnificent and so great and so wonderful it de they deserve a better tune she just kept saying that and I had to you know when she when she asked me a question I spun around on the bench so I'm not facing the piano I'm just sitting there you know and facing her and talking to her and and when she said that it's like wow it's like that same thought was in me I just never voiced it it just it, it uh, struck a chord with me and I thought, you're right. Because I have preached on this many times. I used to preach at a rescue mission. And I was always, always pleading with these men who thought who, their own families rejected them. And they thought God couldn't love them. And I had to persuade them that God loves even them. And no matter what they've done, no matter how low they've gone, God loved the whole world. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, not just if certain people did, but whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I preached that so many times that when she said that, I thought of that last verse, because I've emphasized that last verse many times in this rescue mission. That, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God disbanded. Remember the story of the, of the rich man and Lazarus? When the rich man in hell lift up his eyes and seeth Lazarus in Abraham's bosom afar off. And he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I'm tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, thou now lifetime hast good things. And I'm not going to quote exactly the whole passage. But, but, uh, but now, now uh, Lazarus, bad things. But now he's comforted and you're tormented. And, he's, and then he says, but... He's, he, he says that beside there's a great gulf fixed so that those that would come to us cannot and we cannot come to you. There's a great gulf between heaven and hell. And the gulf may not be so much as distance as some, there can be other gulfs. You know, you can have a friend that turns on you and all of a sudden there's a gulf between you. You know, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong castle. I mean, it's just... There can be a big gulf. There's a huge gulf between a holy God and sinful man. What's going to span that gulf? Nothing can span that gulf unless God, unless God brings grace down to earth. If God in His love and His mercy and His grace offers us eternal life, because there's no way we can pay for it. Man, we have a hard time paying our bills down here, don't we? Sometimes it's tough to pay for a house. If a person doesn't have a house nowadays, unless they got a really, really good paying job, they're probably never going to be stuck in apartments because it's tough to buy a house. Everything's so high priced. How in the world are you going to pay for one single sin when the price is eternal death? There's just no way. That is a gulf that no man can span. No man can bridge. No government can build a bridge. No construction company can build a bridge. There's great bridges in this world. I mean, the San Francisco Bridge was famous. The, the Golden Gate Bridge was famous. Other bridges around the world have, been, have gotten famous. The, what's that, Pontchartrain Bridge down in Louisiana. And uh, there's a bridge that goes out to the Florida Keys. I mean, there's some great bridges in this world, but nothing can span the gap between a holy God and sinful man except one thing. The wonderful grace of Jesus. The amazing grace of Jesus. In fact, the guy that wrote that song, Amazing Grace, is a good example. 
He was a slave trader, a merchant slave ship owner. And he hauled slaves from other countries and took them to market, dropped them off at harbors for them to be uh, sold. And the slave trade was a merciless, horrible, horrible blight on the history of the world. Still is. Slavery has been going on for years. Joseph in the Bible was sold as a slave. Slavery is something that's been going on. So it's so wicked that God put in his law when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. He gave them a law. says, he that any man that stealeth another man and selleth him shall surely be put to death. The death penalty was made by God for those who steal a man from his family and sell him on a market. God hates slavery. That kind of slavery. Now there's another kind of slavery that's actually legitimate. That's when someone owes money they cannot pay. They, cannot, they don't have the money. Well then, according to God's law, then you should work for that person and work off that debt. Even if you have to work... Uh, extra hours, work your regular job, then go after that, you go and, and, and work for somebody else that you owe until you get it paid off. God's about paying debts. But sin, we have a debt that we cannot pay. There's no way. We've sinned against an infinite God and we owe an infinite debt. We could never pay an infinite debt. And God, knowing that, realized He was the only answer. He didn't realize that. He knew it from the beginning. But God knows the end from the beginning. He knew it, but he planned it all out. And he wrote about it. He even put the story in the stars. It's all been made available to us. But we still have that free will, and a lot of people don't believe it. So you know what we need to do? We need to emphasize how amazing the grace of God is. We need to emphasize how wonderful the grace of God is. We need to emphasize the greatness of the gulf between a holy God and sinful man. That's what this world needs. This world is a sinful world. This world is a wicked world. I mean, people are getting more and more wicked. We're getting more and more callous, more and more disrespectful of other people and other things and people's property. And it's like nothing sacred hardly anymore in this world. What this world needs is the grace of God. We need the grace of God. Now let me show you a couple, couple things. Um, let me show you a little bit about the grace of God that's amazing to me. Turn, if you would, to uh, Matthew chapter 5. Yeah, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And we'll start with verse 44, or 43 rather. Jesus is talking and he says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's common. That's normal, isn't it? What's wrong with that? I mean, that's, that's kind of normal, isn't it? So that's what everybody says. Hey, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. Fight him. You know, it's, it's normal, natural. Verse 44, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on, on, the, evil and on the good. Do you notice that? The sun rises for everybody. God doesn't paint, God doesn't give us eyes where only good people can see a beautiful sunrise. God paints a beautiful sunrise even for the evil to enjoy. Same with sunsets. But he maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. There's the grace of God in nature. Then the sun shines and dries away the clouds and the rain for the unjust just as much as it does for the just. For the evil as much as he does for the good. And then when we need rain, it rains on the unjust just as much as it does on the just. God is such a good God. He's a gracious God. All right, turn to 
Uh, oh, I already quoted it, but John 3.16, For God so loved the world. It didn't say He so loved those that would believe in Him. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then, to confirm that, in 1 John chapter 2, God has John write this down. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, Jesus Christ, he is the propitiation for our sins. And watch this. And not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for the sins of people that he knew would never even believe in him. And never get saved would die and go to hell. Jesus died for their sins too. You say, well, why would Jesus do that? Why didn't he just die for, if they're going to end up having to pay for their own sins, why didn't he not suffer for theirs and just, well, it doesn't matter. An infinite God can suffer any amount of sins. It doesn't matter, number one. And number two, God's smarter. God's smarter than these smart elects that don't believe in God than that mock God. He knew what they would say. He knew someday if, if in hell and someone felt like they were chosen to go to hell or made that way and that Jesus never died for them and say, God, you're unfair. You died for those folks, but you didn't die for me. And Jesus can now say, oh, yes, I died for your sins too. You're just paying because I cannot count my payment to your, your account because you wouldn't believe in me. So you're in hell. It's all your own fault. I did my best to save you without using force because love never forces but you had free will and you chose to go your own way. You chose to reject me. You chose to not believe what I suffered. So therefore, since you don't believe what I suffered, you have to experience what I suffered. But finite man will have to be there forever. So God's a gracious God. He died even and suffered even for those who would not believe in him. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. Now, turn to Isaiah 59.1. I love this verse. Isaiah 59.1. Isaiah was a prophet sent to warn the people of God to come back to God before judgment comes. Judgment's already, already pronounced. It's up to the people when it comes. How long God waits based on how they live. How, whether they return to Him and hearken to Him or not. So in chapter, chapter 59, verse 1, God makes this amazing statement. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither His ear heavy that it cannot hear. The problem is never, ever going to be that God cannot hear or that his, he cannot say because um, our arm's not long enough to reach how into the depths of sin you've gone. No, God's hand is not shortened that he can't save someone who's gone down the very depths of sin, the deepest anyone's ever gone. God can save anybody. It's just the problem is that people who go that deep the deeper you go, the less likely it is that you're going to wake up to realize how deep you are. And your mind's going to get corrupted and perverted to person you're not even going to be able to consider God. So, it's not because God's hand is shortened. No, because His grace, His grace can span that gap. That gap. There, is, there is no bridge man can make, but God has made a bridge between man, sinful man, and God. Turn, if you would, please, to Second, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 1 Timothy, chapter 2. 1 Timothy, chapter 2. First Timothy, chapter 2. And verse 3. Or, um, yeah, verse, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. I'm not going to read what's before that for context sake because it's not relevant to what I'm preaching to right now. But anyway, so, uh, I mean, kind of, sort of, but I want to get to the next verses. 
So the last phrase of verse 3 is God our Savior. In the sight of God our Savior. And then verse 4 refers to God our Savior with the word who. All right? So God our Savior says about him, it says, who will have all men to be saved? Who will? That's his will. His will is that all men get saved. But hey, guess what? God's will isn't always done. If God's will is always done, why would Jesus tell us to pray, thy will be done? We should ask God that his will be done. Why? Because it won't be done. Because a lot of people refuse to let God have his way with their life. They have free will. And God will not interfere with their free will except through the power of influence, but never with the power of force, except on Judgment Day. And then he's not going to force everybody to believe in him. Everybody will because it's real. When you stand before God and you've been raised from the dead and you're standing before God, you can't help but know that he is God and every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. It, that will happen. But they won't be able to help it because it's so real they'll be in his presence. It's not because they're going to have a change of heart. No, it's a change of what's obvious. All they cared about on, on earth when they were alive was the physical things and monetary things and, and uh, things of pleasure and entertainment and, and work and making money and getting power over people and, and building up their life and increasing whatever they can increase. But now that's all gone. and They're standing before their creator. Yeah, they're going to bow. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. That one whose name they took in vain billions of times, possibly. Thousands of times, for sure. Yeah, their knee's going to bow. Because they can't help it. Not because all of a sudden, oh Lord, you're my Savior. No, he's their judge now. And the books will be opened. And the dead will be judged out of those things written in the books. And another book will be opened, which is the book of life. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There's going to be many religious people there who are going to stand and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and uh, cast out devils in thy name and done many wonderful works in thy, name, in thy name? And Jesus is going to say to them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Because they had religion, but they didn't ever get born again where God knew them as his child, spiritual child. So, now, with that said, God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, he wants, but he won't force it. He wants all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. There's a lot of, there's, you can know something that's not true. I know that two plus three is not four. I know that. You can know of a lie. You know, a lot of people spend their lives working for lies. <laughs> hey, to get in politics, look at, look at these progressive Democrats. They're, they're just pushing lies like crazy. They don't care about truth. And a lot of Republicans do. I shouldn't get political because I don't care for either party. <laughs> uh, the higher up you go, the more corrupt they, they both are. And uh, they're both being controlled by the same, same uh, small group of men probably. But anyway, but... but God, his desire, his will is that all men to be, be, be saved and that all men come to the knowledge of the truth. And now look at verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. One mediator. What's a mediator? A go-between. Some who mediates. Here's a person who's upset with this person. A mediator sums up, hey, let me help you guys solve your problem. Let me help you get, become friends again. Look, and, and he mediates between two people that are at odds with each other, that are, that are alienated from each other. See, we ha in, in government, we have ambassadors, don't we? Ambassadors are used to represent a country when they go to, they go to another country, represent another country to maintain and establish relationships and try to keep those relationships in good shape. And when it's not in good shape, they try to find ways and talks. And we have these talks. We have these summits of nations trying to keep, maintain peace so we don't blow each other out of the water all the, uh, over every little thing. And so that's what an ambassador is and a mediator. There's only one mediator between God and man. There's only one bridge that can span that mighty gulf. 
that God did span. God's the only one that can. And God became flesh. Jesus is that mediator. See, God, our Savior, is the one that wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus himself on earth, he said, ye will not come to me because ye will not come to me. You don't choose. It's not your will to come to me. Jesus is that mediator. And he is that God. He's his own mediator. Jesus, God and man. And he became the mediator because he made man in his image. So how, how, how difficult is that to figure out? If God made man in his image, then God's going to, when God shows himself in an image, it's going to, it's Jesus. Jesus is, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so Jesus is that mediator. And that's why Jesus is the only one that can span the gap. Now, I preach this. You all know the, the gospel well. I know, but I just wanted to emphasize this so that anybody else can hear this message and maybe understand finally that there's no other mediator. No church, no priest, no amount of good works that you can do, no baptism, no water so holy that when you sprinkle on you, you get cleansing from your sins. No, there's nothing like that. Nobody's so holy that if they just let, let, uh, lay their hand on your head, your sins will go away. There is nothing like that. There is no bridge but Jesus Christ, the grace of God. Now, with that said, turn with me. How are we going to get that grace to other people? How are, we going to do, how are they going to know when they're surrounded by things that attract their attention? Turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I won't be long. I really want to just spend a lot of time emphasizing that bridge or that span, that which spans the depths of difference, the, 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 the almost infinite distance between God and man. It's not quite infinite, but it's, it's, it's yeah, I guess it would be infinite. Because Job says that your, your iniquities are infinite. So I guess it would be infinite. So only an infinite God can span that gap. John chapter 1, look at verse 14. And the Word was made flesh, that's Jesus. We know that because in the beginning was the Word, verse 1, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. God became flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3, uh, 16. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. You're not going to experience the grace of God living a lie or following a lie, following a false religion, uh, participating in, in works when God says it's not by for we are saved by grace through faith not of works lest any man should boast. You're going to be following a lie if you believe you're going to get saved by your works. So God Jesus is full of grace and truth. Verse 15 John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me. Wait a minute. John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus was. But he's, a, he's attesting to the fact, testifying to the fact that Jesus was God. Manifest the flesh. Therefore, Jesus was before he was. See, he that cometh after me, notice he that was born six months after me, and born of my mother's cousin, he that cometh after me and is going to be preaching to you, he is preferred before me for because he was before me, because he's God. Verse 16, and of his fullness have all we received. Of his fullness have all we, re we received. Wait a minute. Fullness? What fullness? Well, go back to verse 14. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Skip the, the parentheses, full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And you know what? John testifies here, of his fullness have all we received. We meaning we who have believed on him. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you become a child of God. You're born in his family that moment. It's not a gradual process. No, it's a gradual process where you get to the point where you, 
where you learn things, but there's a point where you get born. Jesus said to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. So being born again doesn't take place at the end of life. It takes place, it must take place during your life before you live. Before, I'm sorry, before you die. And it takes place the moment you have faith. Um, see, how does that phrase go? Um, faith to the... Um, Faith to the salvation of the soul. Where you believe to the, to, the, to the saving of the soul. That's the phrase I'm looking for. Believe to the saving of the soul. A lot of people believe a lot of things and different things. But there's a belief or a faith you must have that will cause God to save your soul. The moment he sees that kind of faith. And it's not the kind of faith that gives so much money, that does this or does good works or sings in the choir or sings a great special or preaches a special sermon or goes and sacrifices to be a missionary or goes and sells all you have and gives to the poor. No, no. God's looking for the kind of faith where you believe what he says of who he is and of what he did. That you are a sinner and there's a great gulf that you cannot span and that only God can span that. And God did when he became flesh and dwelt among us and his name was Jesus Christ. And you realize that what Jesus suffered, that he died on the cross and his soul went to hell, suffered in, in infinite debt in hell. Being the infinite God, only he could do that. And he did that in three days and he rose from the dead and he offers eternal life as a gift to whoever will believe in him. The moment God sees that you believe those things, He saves your soul. That's what believing to the saving of the soul means. Where God sees the kind of faith that, that moves Him to action to save your soul. So, it'll never, so you'll never perish. You become one of His sheep and you'll never perish. So that's what Jesus did for us. And he's full of grace and truth. But we who have been born again, we have received some of his fullness. Of his, we don't have all his fullness, but of his fullness, we have some. We have grace. And it says, and grace for grace. You know why? Because, because we, we're not infinite. We can be gracious one day and ungracious another day. So we need to get right with God and get more grace. So grace for grace, because our grace runs out. It's not infinite like God's. We just have, we have just some of his grace. So my last point I want to make is let's grow in grace, as Peter said. No one turned to the last verse of, I think, 1 Peter. Uh, uh, grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Something, somewhere in there, last of near the end of 1st or 2nd Peter. So let's grow in grace. Let's get grace every day. Every day we need grace. I'll, I'll give you one last scripture. Turn to Hebrews uh, chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I'll close with this. Let me tell you something. I was, I was talking to someone this past week who experienced ungraciousness from a particular uh, person, a particular preacher, I'll just put it that way, and, uh, and it hurt a lot. A lot of people have been hurt by Christians who've been ungracious. So that's why we must grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A lot of people grow in knowledge, but they don't grow in grace. You grow in knowledge without grace, then your knowledge is going to hurt people. While you're claiming to help them, you're actually going to drive them away because there's no grace. God didn't come down and, and when he's on the cross, all of a sudden, okay, that's it. I don't need to die for you wicked people. You bow your knee right now. You soldiers, bow your knee. Hey, you a thief couldn't bow his knee. <laughs> he's hanging on the cross. That's why Jesus didn't do that. Not, that's not the only reason why, but it's an illustrative why. He didn't come to make us believe everything that he knows. Because he knows we can't handle it all. And by the way, this, this is kind of the grace we need to grow in. Uh, we, need to grow, we need to realize that some people will not understand some things that you believe when you're right and they're wrong. Some people will never see some things. Now, that's a shame. Yeah, it is. I wish we could all 
see the truth. God will lead us into all truth. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you into all truth, but not everybody, when he leads, not everybody's going to follow. See, that's why we sing songs. Where he leads me, I will follow. It's a song of intent. That's not a song of prophecy because no, everybody doesn't follow where God leads. We're selfish. We are so stinking selfish. So I just want to close in pleading with you to grow in grace. And here's why. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse, uh, I think it's verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of what? <laughs> the throne of grace. Grace is something you've got to get every day. Ask God to give you grace. So that you can give it, so you have it to give to others. So let's come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why do we need to come boldly? Because there's a natural tendency. Because our nature is sinful, we feel guilty. We don't even want to come. Sometimes we don't even want to pray. We don't want to open our Bible. We feel guilty. We've, we've, we've been walking in the flesh. And we feel guilty. And so God says, look, get past that. Come boldly. Why? Because it's the throne of grace. And His grace is sufficient. His gra i got so many things I could say about grace. I could preach for weeks on grace. But, um, but, uh, but God wants you to come boldly. Because if you're a child of God, you can come boldly. Because you're His child. Come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy. That's the first thing mentioned. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Before you get grace, you have to get mercy. Come boldly to the throne of God and say, Lord, I've sinned. Lord, I've messed up. I've done this. I've mistreated so-and-so. Or I, I've been selfish. Whatever. You confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So come boldly, knowing that has, God has promised that he's faithful to forgive. So go boldly. Say, Lord, I've sinned. Yep. Admit it. Confess it. Didn't say, if you come and feel sorry, he says, confess. Just admit it. Just admit it. Confess to God. Agree with him. It's wrong. Quit rationalizing and making excuses. Admit it's wrong. And then God will forgive you. And then once you obtain mercy, <laughs> then you'll find that now that he's forgiven you, he doesn't want you to go empty. See, forgiveness takes away or covers sin. But if that's all you do is get forgiveness and that's all you get, you're going away empty. Because he just took away what you had. He took away your sins. Now you're leaving him empty. No, don't go away empty. It's like going to the store and, uh, and say, here, I want, I, I, someone gave me some money. Someone's gracious and gave me some money. I want to pay my debt. Of, uh, I, you gave me some stuff on credit. It's an old Western illustration. I want to pay my credit. And then you walk out. <laughs> And the guy that gave you the money has got more money. He would like for you to have whatever you need. But you say, all right, I paid my debt. And you walk out of the store with all kinds of stuff there that you could use and need. And you walk out empty. Man, when you go to the throne of grace and ask God to forgive your sins, don't leave the throne empty. Get some grace too. But you're not going to find it unless you confess first. Obtain mercy first. And then you'll find grace to help in time of need. What time of need? Your time? Well, it could be. It, there's a double meaning there. Remember Paul? I, I referenced a while ago. He asked God to take away this thorn in his flesh. Three times he asked, and God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. God wants Paul to keep coming to him for grace to be able to handle this thorn in his flesh. Sometimes God doesn't give you victory over some sin. Sometimes God won't heal something wrong with your body. Because he wants you to live day by day by his grace, obtaining grace. But you're not going to get grace. A lot of people that suffer, they have burdens to bear, they have crosses to bear, and they become bitter. They're not fun to be around. You know what the problem is? Not because God's not gracious. It's because they're not confessing. They're not getting mercy first, and therefore they don't have access to the grace. Mercy is what gives you access to grace. It opens the cupboards. See? Get right with somebody before you can become best friends again. Best friends who have an out, don't say, okay, let's just be best friends again. Forget that, forget that never happened. What happened? You've got you to say, okay, I was wrong. There's got to be confession. 
And then you don't get forgiveness unless you can't forgive somebody for something if they haven't asked you for it. I mean, you can say the word, but there is no forgiveness without, I mean, does that work with God? And people get to heaven and say, well, I believe that God forgave me. Well, did you ever ask? Did you believe in it? No. I just heard he'd forgive all our sins. Well, you heard wrong. He'll forgive if you believe in him and trust him. Something we must do. It's not a work. It's, it's a response. We must believe in him, who he is, and what he did. So, so let's, let's be the kind of people, if we have received such great grace that can span that infinite gap, that means the grace is infinite, which means we can get what we need every day so we can respond to people that are hard to get along with. And we can do so with more grace than we've ever done before. And look, respond, you know, being gracious does not mean to compromise. I was talking to someone, uh, someone this, this week, uh, and I made this statement. I said, I work at being a gracious man, but I will never compromise what I believe the Bible to be, what I believe the Bible teaches. I will never change my mind. It doesn't mean I'll never change my mind because I might find out I'm wrong, but when, I, when I'm convinced that I'm right, I'm not going to change my mind unless God shows me I'm wrong. Why? Because I'm not going to compromise truth because if you compromise truth, you have a lie. You compromise purity, you have corruption. We must not compromise, but we must realize we're sinners. We may not understand things. So, so anyway, I, told, I will always be gracious. I, I strive to always be gracious, but I will never compromise. Let my graciousness lead to compromise where all of a sudden I'm not standing for truth. And I'm not going to preach the truth. I'll preach the truth even if it hurts. But I'll hurt if you're hurt by truth. I'll hurt for you. It's sad for me to see people suffering because they don't believe right. It's really sad. And it grieves God too. But God's full of grace. And we need to be full of grace. Because there's a span. It's not infinite, but there's a span, a gap between you and someone else that grace, only grace will span. Only break grace will bridge. So Let's thank God for the bridge of grace. And then let's build those bridges. But we can only build them with grace. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you bless the message to our hearts, to our lives. I pray that maybe that somebody who will see this or hear this message on the Internet, uh, if you're gracious, allow it, allow it to be posted, that, uh, that maybe the fruit will come from this and we'll see it in heaven someday. Thank you, Lord. And may you be glorified by all the good that is done as we strive to live, uh, li live grace, live it out in our lives. Help us, Lord, to grow, not just in knowledge, but in grace. In fact, you put grace first. You put grace first. Because knowledge is easy to come by. Just read the Bible and get knowledge. Grace is harder to be done. We have to go to your throne to get it. We've got to admit our faults. We can't go around judging other people and expecting to get grace. And being judgmental all the time, we have to go and confess our sins. And then we can find grace to help in time of need. So bless us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.